all of you know, or I think all of you know, um, Michael Pollan, who spoke last night on marijuana and the botany of desire. You know, of course, that he it will be joining the Berkeley faculty, happily for us, next year in the School of Journalism. You also know that he worked for 11 years as the executive editor of Harper's Magazine, and that he writes for Harper's and for the New York Times Magazine, among other publications. And some of you will have read his article um, on animal rights that appeared this Sunday. He has lots of honors and lots of books, and they're in the little pamphlet uh, <laughs> on um, uh, Michael and the Avenali lecture that's available. So instead of trying to read through all of them, I think I'll simply acknowledge that these definitely exist and that <laughs> his last book, The Botany of Desire, was a bestseller on the New York Times book list for a number uh, uh, of weeks and that is being, it is being translated um, into a, a half dozen uh, foreign languages as we, as we speak probably. So anyway, that's Michael. And then our other panelists are Professor Catherine Gallagher in the Department of English. She's the Eggers Professor of English Literature. She too has many, many honors to her name. She has also been extremely generous in university service, having been on the budget committee. <laughs> <laughs> and G Kathy has written about an, uh, many different topics um, as varied as women slaves, I hope these are varied, women, slaves, and monsters, but she has also <laughs> written about, and I'm really quite sure this is different, potatoes. Uh, Ignacio Tapella is in the College of Natural Resources. He's in the ESPEN program, uh, Environment Policy Management and Society. Science, policy, and management. Well, some of those things and, and yet others. And he is a specialist, um, he's a, uh, a specialist in fungi. In my, he's a mycologist and he does work in mycology and sustainable development and various other aspects of mycology and bioprospecting. Mm -hmm. Yes. And he, too, he is a, uh, have, has written a number of articles in various um, scholarly journals. And he was born in Mexico, which um, I, being in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, feel that I should mention. Uh, and our final speaker will be Patricia Unterman, who is a writer on food and who writes for the San Francisco uh, Examiner, who has written um, uh, a book. What's I'm going to have to consult my. It's called San Francisco Food Lovers Guide. Yes, it's a uh -huh. guide to San Francisco <laughs> <laughs> And she um, is also the co-owner of the Hayes Street Grill. We're going to, in order to torture you a little, uh, let her go last and um, let her speak precisely about the kinds of food interests um, that she has. So in any case, I think that we should begin um, with Michael and then we'll move on to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thank you all for coming. Um, I think what I'll do is uh, talk, try to lay out what strikes me as an important general theme, at least one that keeps coming up in my own work. I've been looking at this question of ecology and food for four years now, um, and I've written this series of articles um, that are sort of chapters in my education, uh, articles really that are kind of first person forays into the food chain. Um, my governing assumption in going into all this and my interest in food is I, I come at it as a nature writer. And I don't know that nature writers often write about food, but it seemed odd to me that they don't. Um, because food, what we eat, is really um, one of the most important ways we engage the natural world. Although we don't really think about it that much when we're contemplating what's on our plate or what we're buying at the, at the grocery store. Um, so what would, what, what would you find out if you looked at it this way? And so I've written this series of pieces. I wrote a, a piece on genetically modified potatoes, which I, I got from Monsanto and grew in my garden a few years ago. Uh, I wrote a piece following an organic TV dinner uh, from the grocery store back to the farms where it was grown. Uh, I wrote a biography of a steer last spring and uh, the piece on Sunday about animal rights. Um, all of these I thought were very different stories and all of them kept bumping into very similar tensions and conflicts that I really do think are at the heart of what's going on in our food system. Um, and that is that there is this fundamental inescapable tension, I think, between the logic of natural systems and how they work 
and the logic of industrial capitalism and how it works and what its needs are. Um, and you find this in animals, you find this in crops and their parasites. And uh, it's at, the, at that crossing road that so many of our problems with the food system crop up. Just to give you a couple examples, I'll, I'll tell you very briefly about these, these four steps and how that issue came up. When I, when I wrote about um, genetic engineering, I got these new leaf potatoes from Monsanto. Uh, this, is a, this, this story is in the last chapter of my book. Uh, it was originally published in the New York Times. Um, I expected the basic narrative of the piece to be the, the, you know, the revolutionary new technology, what are the risks, what are the benefits? Um, do the benefits outweigh the risks? And I'd be looking at environmental questions and health questions and you know, the old versus the new. Um, but it turned out this is not the interesting question really or, or, or the really significant divide. Um, what we were really talking about is two systems. Um, there was on the one hand the industrial way of growing food which is crucially dependent on monoculture. That is to say growing lots of the same thing in the same place at the same time. Um, versus another way of doing it, often practiced by organic farmers and, and traditional farmers, um, that you could call polyculture, which is many different crops. Um, and that um, that was the key divide. And that what was really going on with biotechnology, and this isn't, and, and Ignacio can address this, I don't know if this is inherent in the technology or inherent in the way it's being applied. Um, I, I tend to think the, the latter. Um, all these wonderful things it promised to do were really ways to save monoculture from collapsing, because monoculture is in really big trouble. Um, the Colorado potato beetle, which is the, is the ostensible um, target of the new leaf potato. This is a potato that's been engineered to produce its own pesticide in every cell. Um, the Colorado potato beetle is a big problem for farmers uh, who are growing huge potato crops in places like Idaho and western Washington and Oregon. Um, interestingly enough, though, the Colorado potato beetle is not a big problem on organic farms um, where you have polyculture. Uh, so that, and the reason that we need a new leaf potato, or the reason the industry thinks it needs a new leaf potato, is that the pesticides that used to be used don't work as well as they once did because monocultures eventually will breed um, resistance. Uh, any, use any pesticide enough and, and the, the pests will evolve uh, an uh, invulnerability to that, to that chemical. And it's very hard to introduce new chemicals, so the industry really turned to this technology to bail itself out. Um, but the perception is that, you know, this is a technology that solves a beetle problem, not that the beetle problem is a problem of monoculture, that there's a system here. So it, it has a Band-Aid quality, as far as I can see so far. Um, and it is a very powerful technology, and monoculture is a very powerful idea. And it's, it's really crucial to the way industrial agriculture works. It gives you the economies of scale you need. Uh, without a monoculture, you can't scale up to giant combines. Um, you can't have um, one great potato like the russet Burbank, you know, which is in every French fry just about you've ever eaten at McDonald's because it's the nice long French fry that comes out of those red boxes like a little bouquet. And you know, they, they will only use uh, russet Burbanks. Um, that idea of marketing one ideal of a french fry uh, to the whole world dictates a monoculture because you've got to grow enough of that potato to satisfy that platonic ideal of what a french fry should be. Um, and it's very interesting that the system have, confronting this problem of monoculture, and I think this is very, you know, really classic of, of, uh, of, of our incredibly creative capitalist system, rather than go back and fix the systemic problem, creates a new business fixing the problem. Uh, and so you have the solution. Um, and it's very expensive, very high capital, and there's a whole new industry that can make money off of this problem. Um, but biotechnology is also very well suited to industrial capitalism. And I'm, I won't really talk about 
how well is it suited to the natural world now. We can maybe Ignacio can address that or we can talk about it later. But it's it's beautifully suited to the way capitalism works. Um, not only does it help you rescue monoculture, it promotes monoculture because you're using um, similar traits across many uh, many um, different crops. You're you're also you have bigger companies selling the potatoes. It allows for more consolidation, but it also is perfect for patenting and and even more important patent enforcement. Because when you uh, genetically engineer a crop, it's very easy to prove that it's novel and that you uh, own it. It's almost like putting a barcode on every leaf of every plant in the field because the, uh, the people at Monsanto can take a little snip off the corner of a, of a leaf and do a test right in the field and say, this is our intellectual property. So it takes nature and converts it into intellectual property in a, in a very beautiful way. And one of the impediments to capitalism in nature has been this this very uh, wonderful or annoying uh, um, fact about plants, which is that they keep making more of themselves. <laughs> they have seeds that create plants, they create seeds, and you, you just can't control this. And you sell a hybrid, uh, a great hybrid soybean, and, and the farmers just save a few of these seeds and can replant them. And that doesn't seem, you know, this is like uh, sharing music over the internet. We have to do something about this. So. Um, and biotechnology even allows you to take this further. There, there are technologies now, uh, there's something called the Terminator technology you may have heard about that allows you to um, uh, produce a plant that no longer does that annoying thing of letting you reproduce it ad infinitum. The plant in the second generation is sterile, um, or the seeds produced by the plant in the first generation are sterile. Um, and then there are a whole other products that the plants will only exhibit the traits you want, whether it's insect resistance uh, or whatever, after you've sprayed them with your own proprietary chemicals. So it gives you, it's, it's, people have described it as, as a new enclosure movement of nature. So you see how really um, this logic of industrialism uh, enters into nature and there's, there's an enormous force behind that. But I saw as an alternative organic, and, I, and doing this piece was really my introduction to organic agriculture. So I thought, well, I should write about that. This is a you know, wonderful alternative. So I, I launched on the second chapter in this education. Um, and there I went into it thinking, well, the divide here is going to be conventional versus organic food. That's going to be my story. Um, but what you find when you look at organic, and I think people in California understand this better than people in the East, is that this logic of industrial thinking and uh, production has come now to organic. Um, and you have this situation of you know, processed food made with hundreds of ingredients sourced from dozens of different states. Um, but very interesting thing happens. What I did was I followed this company called Cascadian Farm. Uh, Gene Kahn founded it. He was one of the pioneers of organic. He was uh, you know, a hippie English major in the 70s who got into organic farming, the classic kind of story. Now he's a vice president at General Mills, and he's selling organic TV dinners and things like that. And, um, and he has this beautiful, they still have Cascadian Farm, the little picture on the label. It really exists. But now it's kind of a show farm. And I said, well, you know, you don't seem to grow any food here. I said, well, this farm's too small. We can't get enough. You know, if you're selling frozen corn, say, you've got to, you can't buy from small farmers anymore. You've got, uh, the, you know, the, he, he described the maw of the processing beast needs two acres of corn an hour. Uh, to bring a combine through a field. So you've really got to move to large scale, guess what, monoculture, um, which you know, is, is so opposed to the, to the fundamental idea of organic. Uh, also, you have to use all the same kind of corn. You have to use Jubilee, because it's the one that freezes really well and, and it ripens properly to, uh, to um, so you, 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 what you have is you're developing a new kind of factory farm, an organic factory farm that is, um, uh, much better than the alternative, um, but it's still a factory. It's still consecrated to these principles of inputs and outputs. Um, so you have this new, this new thing, uh, industrial organic, which sounds like a contradiction in terms, and, and I think probably is, and there's a real question as to whether it's sustainable, whether you can grow organically on that kind of scale. Um, so there again I sound that split. There was the, the, the kind of the, the logic of natural systems. And there are many organic farms still practicing that kind of agriculture. They're very small, and they're about to be swamped. And many of them are being put out of business by uh, the very large ones, uh, particularly in the East Coast, where they can't really compete against the large West Coast organic farms. Um, but th 
the drift again is toward this, this inexorable logic of, of doing it on as monoculture, as close to monoculture as you can get with organic. Third chapter, uh, I did this biography of a, a steer, um, which published in the Times last spring, and I bought this, this steer and followed it through the whole process. And, um, you know, the way, the whole idea of a steer or a cow or any ruminant um, uh, is a, it, it's actually a, a wonderfully sustainable kind of food system <coughs> in principle. I mean, here you have these animals. A ruminant is an animal that can digest grass, something we can't do. This is a wonderful ability they have to take land that we really can't do very much with because it's too hilly, it's only good for grass, maybe it's too arid, and they can, because of these marvelous stomachs, these rumens, uh, which are kind of fermentation tanks, they can convert that grass into high quality protein. Um, and you don't need chemicals, uh, all you need is a cow, some sunlight, some water, some grass. But as I looked into it, it's not how we do it. This process has been improved by industrial efficiency. Uh, what happens is you take the cow uh, or the steer, and after six months, the first six months of its life, it spends on the farm with its mother, you uh, take it off the farm and you, and you start accustoming it to eating corn, which they're not evolved to eat. They haven't encountered corn before. Um, but they can be sort of trained to eat corn if you give them some drugs to keep them from getting sick. So the corn, the new diet, what the new diet allows you to do is get to market much quicker. You can get the animal to 1,100 pounds in 14 or 16 months instead of the usual two years. So time is money and you do this. And corn is really, really cheap for a whole other set of reasons that we subsidize it. Uh, the price of corn is about a dollar less than it costs to grow. And that's because all of us pay the, uh, the difference um, in, in subsidies. So this logic is inexorable. Again, um, feed them corn, they'll grow more quickly. Yes, you have to give them drugs too, but that doesn't cost that much. And you end up with this system, which is uh, full of, again, problems. Uh, one is food poisoning. Um, without going into great detail, cows fed on corn, their stomach is acidified in a way that makes it a very good host for E. coli 0157, which is the agent that sickens and kills children when they get it in hamburgers. This is not a problem that you find in grass-fed meat. It's not a problem you found anywhere until 1982 or so. Um, so here we have a systemic problem. Feeding cows corn leads to this very serious microbe getting into our food supply. So again, what do we do? Do we go back and fix the system? Do we start giving them a little more grass at the, because uh, if you gave them five days of grass on the feedlot, their stomachs would uh, no longer be acid, the E. coli would die, and, and you, would have, you wouldn't have nearly the problem we have with it. No, 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 much better to make money on a new fix, and that new fix, of course, is irradiation. So rather than remove the manure with E. coli from the meat, we just zap the manure in the meat so the meat is, so the, the manure that you're eating is no longer toxic. <laughs> um, so you see the, uh, you know, you see again how the logic works and there is this, uh, and, and how it's fighting the natural systems um, in all these ways. Um, animal rights, the piece that, that I, I did on Sunday, you see very similar kind of um, uh, uh, split there, but here it's between, um, not between an industrial system and a natural system, but between another form of human artifice, our moral system, our moral order, and natural systems. And there, too, you see this very interesting clash, and that's what I tried to develop in that piece. Um, if you accept that our tradition of moral philosophy is the proper way to look at our relationship to animals, um, you, you come out thinking, well, yeah, they should have rights, of course. I mean, if the standard for moral consideration is relieving suffering, and they do suffer, we know they suffer, then perhaps we should give them rights. But is that the right system to bring to the natural world is really the question I dealt with. And I concluded that it's not. If you look at things ecologically, you see that the vegetarian utopia um, has all sorts of problems. Uh, you end up killing more animals, actually, because even when you're growing grain and vegetables, many animals must die in this process um, because of your pesticides, because of your farm equipment. Um, you can't escape killing animals. And, and I, I cite the work of a, 
animal scientist at uh, Oregon who calculated that if we all switched over to a vegetarian diet, more animals would die because we'd be taking this pasture land to the extent we're using pasture land and be putting row crops on it and the combines and everything would be killing more animals. And he, he makes the case that uh, if you want to kill the least number of animals possible, you should be eating beef grown on grass because it's a really large animal on ground that doesn't have to be tilled. And um, so it's an interesting argument. But the vegetarian utopia also, though, is a very urban idea that um, flies in the face of how nature works in this sense. And then I'll, I'll finish up. Um, uh, there's so many places where you can't grow row crops, where, as I said earlier, um, animals, ruminants, are the best way to get food off of the land, to turn sunlight and grass into protein. Uh, so you're condemning all those places either to being immoral in, vi in violation of animal rights, uh, and these are, these are you know, huge swaths of the world, and, and the place where I live, New England, where you can't grow a lot of row crops, uh, but you can grow animals very well. Uh, or you're making people dependent on this industrial system, food that's flown in or, or, or driven in from a long way away. Um, and that a sustainable agriculture, the people who, who, who work on that, uh, will tell you, you need animals to have a sustainable agriculture, to have those systems, that you, that you need the animals to cycle the nutrients, to eat the crop wastes, to give you the fertilizer, um, to, to remove yourself from the industrial system, from industrial fertilizers. And without animals, you're stuck with a highly industrialized system. So again, you see that tension again, but here it's between another kind of human artifice. So my conclusion, if I have one, is just that, you know, I don't, I don't really yet, is that we need to recognize there are these tensions and realize that nature may not yield to this constant process of being turned into uh, a factory. Um, without a lot of very unpredictable effects. And we see them all around us. Uh, you know, the epidemic of food poisoning, agricultural pollution, a crisis of where we're losing our pollinators, the bees are, are dying, um, and that's tied to monoculture. Uh, elevated cancer rates may be tied to what's going on in agriculture, even early puberty. Uh, farms are not factories, and they're embedded in natural systems, and, uh, and they cannot operate at cross purposes with them forever. So I think I'll leave it there and hope that that opens up onto what other people wanted to say a little bit. It certainly does open up onto what I want to talk about, uh, the tensions between natural systems and how they work and the logic of industrial capitalism um, is also my topic, but what I want to do this afternoon is to give you some early iterations of that. Um, iterations that come, I think, quite surprisingly from inside 19th century British political economy. Um, I want, though, first of all, to apologize for the fact that I'm going to be reading my paper after listening to this quite elegant, extemporaneous discourse uh, I feel especially bad about that. However, this is so <laughs> this, <laughs> <laughs> this is um, it, this is complicated, and I'm afraid that I will simply get lost in the complications and go far beyond the 15 minutes that have been allotted to me if I don't read it to you. And so, to add insult to injury, please listen very carefully <laughs> because I'm going to read this very fast. <laughs> The word ecology is a Victorian coinage introduced by translators of Ernst Haeckel in the 1870s and derived by analogy to the word economy from the Greek word oikos, meaning dwelling or household. Ecology was meant to signify an extension of the notion of economy from the realm of human activity to that of plants and animals. Ecology is the science, as the OED says in its first definition, of the economy of animals and plants. The connections between the, between, um, I'm already lost, between political economy and proto-ecology, and I'm going to call it proto-ecology when I talk about it prior to the 1870s because it's not yet evolutionary. Um, those tensions go, and, and connections go far beyond analogy and nomenclature though. In the English-speaking world at least, an interest in the ecology of food, of human food, 
was at the heart of political economy and shaped several of its classical premises. A popular understanding of ecology now opposes it to commercial interests. How often do we hear, as we've just been hearing, that ecological concerns are in conflict with economic growth? Um, but I'd like to sketch today how that very opposition, how that very tension was established not as a matter of competing specialties, but rather inside the discipline of political economy itself. And I'm going to begin this sketch a bit arbitrarily, because one could go back further. I'm going to begin it with Malthus. Um, because in sections of the first edition of his essay on population, the economic unit of his investigation is not the nation or even the human population, but what we might now call an ecosystem, or what I tend to call a bioeconomy. And in those bioeconomic discussions of his in that first edition of the essay, it later, by the way, he um, heavily revised and sometimes altogether scrapped what he'd said there, he expressed his alarm about how market forces were disabling the production of, of sufficient available food. Indeed, when considering the contemporary late 18th century state of the laboring population, Malthus sounded less like a budding political economist than like a conservative or radical critic of modernity, especially of a commercial urbanized um, industrial modernity. He expressed the opinion, for example, that working people were probably better off in the early 17th century, not because they were increasing too rapidly in the late 18th century, but because the fund out of which they were supported, by which he meant basically grain, was not keeping pace with their greater number. And he blamed the plight of the, of the poor squarely on the growth of commercial and industrial wealth. That's, that's where he placed it. Which he thought was hiding the real condition of the mass of people by misrepresenting the size of the fund for the support of labor. The false promises of an economy dominated by commerce and industry were, in Malthus's view, tricking the feeble poor into reproducing themselves, not necessarily beyond the country's potential ability to feed them, but certainly beyond its realized agricultural capacity. To this relatively new ability of a society to misrepresent the size of its fund for the support of laboring people, that is, to promise, to promise prosperity to urban, commercial, and industrial workers through high money wages, and then to betray that promise by offering dear and scarce provisions, Malthus attributed a new dynamic equilibrium of working class misery. Moreover, he argued in those passages that the political economy of Adam Smith was itself part of the problem. For the more a society believes that the nation's wealth equals its exchangeable value, the more it believes in the abstract equivalences expressed, for example, in money terms, the more enfeebled the body of labor will become. It's evident, he wrote, that two nations might increase exactly with the same rapidity in the exchangeable value of the annual produce of their land and labor, Yet, if one had applied itself chiefly to agriculture and the other chiefly to commerce, the funds for the maintenance of labor and consequently the effect of the increase of wealth in each nation would be extremely different." Unquote. The gross produce of the land, he reasoned, is a more accurate definition of the nation's wealth. Malthus insisted that Adam Smith had committed a fundamental error in representing every increase in the revenue or stock of society as an increase in the funds for the maintenance of labor. Denying Smith's emphasis on the efforts of labor to produce the nation's wealth in myriad forms, Malthus, at this early stage in his thought, agreed with the French physiocrats, the economistes, as their English contemporaries call them, that a nation's true wealth is the produce, is only the produce of labor on the land. Malthus blamed the habit of regarding all commodities as abstractly fungible items, the conflation of value in general with exchangeable value, for encouraging unhealthy towns, inflating the money economy, proliferating non-agricultural enterprises, and ultimately lowering the overall standard of living among the working population. A political economy that left out of account the commodity's contribution to mass nutrition allowed the pounds of healthy flesh, he thought, rightly destined for productive bodies, to get stuck in the wrong places, such as manufacturing towns, which prevented the flow of capital then back to the countryside. But the displacement of potential nutrition took place, he believed, even in agriculture, where it was most graphically illustrated by Malthus's description of how a surplus of commercial wealth 
alters the very biological economy of a country to the detriment of agricultural productive workers. Money made in trade and manufacturing becomes, he tells us, quote, an increased demand for butcher's meat of the best quality, and in consequence, a greater quantity of good land has annually been employed in grazing. This new dis distribution of land led to a diminution of human subsistence, which might have counterbalanced the, the advantages derived from the enclosure of wastelands and the general improvements of husbandry, unquote. Thus, a commercial economy reshapes the relative proportions of vegetable, animal, and human matter. This is another quotation from, from Malthus. The present price will not only pay for fattening cattle on the very best land, but will even allow of the rearing many on land that would bear good crops of corn. The same number of cattle as were formerly raised in wastelands, or even the same weight of cattle at the different periods when killed, will have consumed very different quantities of human subsistence. A fattened beast may in some respects be considered in the language of the French economists as an unproductive laborer. He has added nothing to the value of the raw produce he has consumed. The present system of grazing and undoubtedly tends more than the former system to diminish the quantity of human subsistence in the country in proportion to the general fertility of the land." Unquote. The biological economy envisioned by Malthus is one in which cattle, rather than the proverbial sheep, eat men. So many potential pounds of human flesh are converted uh, through the conversion of land from tillage to pasture into so many pounds of animal flesh which by an undeniable caloric arithmetic can never be converted back into an equal number of pounds of human flesh. That beast thus stands as an impediment to value as Malthus imagined it, or more precisely, it stands for the displacement of value. Created by a surplus of money flowing from non-agricultural sources, it is the explicit embodiment of unproductive labor. We might call it the fatted beast of, mar of modern commercial society, a striking contrast to the diminished body of the productive agricultural worker. Well, Malthus subsequently modified his definitions of wealth and productive labor, bringing them more closely into line with Smith's and later David Ricardo's. But even after he capitulated to the orthodox view that industrial labor might be no less productive than farming grain, he nevertheless continued to insist on the primacy of agriculture in the nation's economy because a plentiful supply of food, he reasoned, was the basis of all other production. Moreover, one of the arguments he used to demonstrate the uniqueness of agricultural production, its natural difference from industrial endeavor, became a founding proposition of Ricardian economics. The theory of diminishing returns held that agricultural skill remaining the same, I'm, I'm mixing my language here with that of the political economist, so when it sounds really bad, it's them. <laughs> That agricultural skill remaining the same, additional labor employed on the land within a given district produces, in general, a less proportionate return, or in other words, that though with every increase of the labor bestowed, the aggregate return is increased, the increase of the return is not in proportion to the increase of the labor. That particular formulation is NASA seniors, but with few variations, it stood as a fundamental postulate of political economy from the 1810s until the 1870s combined with Malthus's proposition that rents in general would be based on the cost of obtaining a crop from the least fertile lands, which were last brought into cultivation. Higher rents and diminishing returns in agriculture would then lead to, greater, to a greater share of the total national product going to wages and a proportionate fall in the rate of profit. <coughs> it was thought that the big difference between manufacturing and agriculture was that industrial improvement made the unit cost of each product cheaper in manufacturing, all other things being equal, while in agriculture, given the relative infertility <coughs> of the most recently cultivated lands, costs would tend to rise even if techniques of production improved. And eventually, the higher costs in agriculture were bound to transfer into manufacturing, leaving, as a general result, a constant tendency toward an increase of capital going to wages and population and toward a fall in the rate of profits. Therefore, despite the fact that the labor theory of value seemed indifferent to the biological significance of commodities, numerous other facets of political econ economic theory continually raise the problem of the food supply. The theories of rent, of the wages fund, and of the falling rate of profit 
in addition to the population principle, all demonstrate political economy's perennial preoccupation with the physiological preconditions of labor and with the extent to which commodity production and exchange are grounded in transfers of biological energy. And that that energetics also seems constantly to be running out. In short, classical political economy had formed itself around an environmental dilemma in which economic growth would always tend toward an unbearably pressured agriculture. Then, turning point, in the mid-Victorian decades, the focus on the biological aspects of political economy both intensified and transformed itself, promising, falsely it turned out, some new solutions to the old problems. The sanitary condition of Britain became a major concern of a group of political economists who started a current of thought that ran counter to the orthodox belief in agricultural depletion, rising rents, and, and the falling rate of profit. The inquiry into the health of towns um, grew directly out of the reform of the poor laws through the extraordinary efforts of the new poor law's main architect, who had previously been Jeremy Bentham's amanuensis, that is, Edwin Chadwick. Throughout the 1840s, 50s, and 60s, Chadwick and other sanitarians tried to integrate the study of the nation's wealth with that of its health, and Chadwick devised a scheme that would revolutionize, he hoped, the ecology of food by putting the city, hitherto merely a site of food consumption, at the hub of a reconceived cycle of food production. Chadwick's ambition was to overcome the Malthusian dilemma by reasserting and also reimagining the connection between the national economy and its organic environment, its life-supporting resources. In the Malthusian model, the production and consumption of food were clearly defined opposites. The energy spent on food production needed to be replaced by food consumption, but the labor became increasingly arduous while the yield became ever scantier. In the sanitarian's revision, though, consumption itself created byproducts human and other animal wastes that could be used to grow more food. These wastes were concentrated in the great towns. So the city now becomes a kind of place of fertility. Sanitarians intended not only to dispose of the waste, which caused disease, but also to put it back into the soil, which would in turn become more fertile. Proposals abounded for returning the organic waste of towns to the earth for use in further rounds of production many of them asserting that the tendency of food to become dearer and scarcer, the organic underpinning of the falling rate of profit tendency, could be overcome by the proper husbanding of human waste. Showing the kinship between economic and ecological thought in this phase, one popular metaphor held that each nation had a God-given capital of fertilizing elements which generated food as its interest. And these fertilizing elements, including not only human waste, but in some proposals decomposing human bodies, had, a way had to be found, uh, they argued, to return this capital to the food producing earth so that it could uh, return sufficient interest in calories to keep the population alive. That is, a model of self-sustaining growth based on the continual recycling of the population's own remains. The more people, the more waste, the more waste, the more food, the more food, the more people, right? This goes on and on was imagined in response to the Malthusian Ricardian theory of diminishing returns. Moreover, the very thing that had seemed most offensive about the cities, the, the sheer amount of they contained, became newly redemptive. Chadwick famously wanted to build sewers, not only to carry off London's ordure, but also to carry it down the river to manure large-scale agricultural endeavors. Given that London did not even have a pressurized water system or a rudimentary sewer network at the time, Chadwick's was a hugely ambitious scheme. And those who supported it set about making it seem like a practical necessity, largely by publicizing how much recycling of human and other forms of waste already took place in the capital and how much wealth it produced. That is, they were, they were trying very hard to make this pay off as a capitalist endeavor. A complementary tactic was to stress the danger of letting the shit fly in the city. Although there was considerable disagreement over how large concentrations of decomposing matter caused disease, everyone thought that they did. 
Life's remains had to be kept in productive circulation, never allowed to wash away in the river or to accumulate in stagnating pools and suffocating piles. Hence, dead and decomposing human matter was organized in the sanitarian's bioeconomy as the seeds alike of life and death. It was a version that appealed especially to the literary imagination. And writers such as Charles Dickens, John Ruskin, Charles Kingsley, who had hated everything else the political economists had proposed, were really smitten with this idea. Indeed, in the literature of the 50s and 60s, a reverential attitude toward waste and its retrieval developed. Um, think, for example, of Dickens as our mutual friend, Kingsley's water babies, Ruskin's claim that a good sewer is a far nobler and a far holier thing than the most admired Madonna ever painted. <laughs> <laughs> Sanitarianism inspired a host of resurrectionist fantasies, which if I had time, I could trace all the way down to T.S. Eliot. So that's little, my little hello to the English department. <laughs> I have to finish this story, though, about the internal tension between political economy and its own proto-ecological thought. Despite their claims, the sanitarians did not resolve the tension. Their sewer farms proved both economically and ecologically untenable. But by the time their failures were incontrovertibly evident, the vast new grain supplies of Europe and North America had become available, easing the pressure on homegrown British produce. Simultaneously, the marginal revolution in economic theory put an end to classical political economy per se, to the political part of political economy per se, and sidelined those previously dominant issues um, that dealt with the problematics of growth and distribution. Meanwhile, Darwin had general, generalized one of the Malthusian principles to explain the dynamics of nature as a whole. And that piece of political economy became a starting point for the separate evolutionary science of ecology. As Haeckel put it, all the various relations of animals and plants to one another and to the outer world with which the ecology of organisms has to do admit of simple and natural explanation only on the doctrine of adaptation and heredity. All of these events of the 1870s sent ecological and economic concerns off on what now seemed to us to be largely their own antagonistic trajectories. Of course, there were always economists interested in food production and ecologists worried about economic feasibility, but the macro bioeconomic issues did tend to recede, only to come roaring back into popular consciousness as a problem for developed countries relatively recently. These, the two views that I sketched here, that is the pessimistic classical account um, in which a healthy food supply is always in tension with uh, industrialization and profits, that one, and the optimistic Chadwickian view in which we direct economic activity into the ecological dynamic as a resource instead of as a burden, thereby partly reconciling the two interests. Those two views, no doubt, also have their present day analogs, which I hope we'll hear about. If this little history has any point, it's the, it's the point that little histories always have, which is that these tensions are not new. Um, that's, that's what historians are always there to tell you. Right? Mm, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> and that the anomalous state would be one in which economists were not worried about the ecology of food and in which ecologists were not worried about the economy. Man, Kathy, you, when you warn us about uh, mixing the languages of political e economy, against mixing the language of political economy and cultural studies or cultural history, I really feel um, worried that I'm going to be driving into this like a ram in a china shop. <laughs> My language is, uh, as a, a person from the Department of Environmental <laughs> Science, Policy and Management <laughs> is uh, bastardized, and we call it interdisciplinary. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, and I wanted to thank, uh, first of all, I wanted to thank the Avenali family for making this possible. It was wonderful to listen to Michael last night, and uh, it's great to know that he's coming to campus and be more available, even though he has been available over the last couple of years um, to our campus. And, uh, and I wanted to thank you, Candace, for inviting me to be here and for being very flexible and make me believe that what I was here to do was <laughs> to converse with Michael and to converse with all of you. Uh, so I was prepared for a conversation, and, um, and what I wanted to do really was to provide a frame for Michael and 
to come to the point where I could try and explain why, who I think Michael is in, in the larger picture and, uh, and why I'm happy that he's, that he's coming to campus uh, and how he represents, I think, the positioning that all of us, I think, this, this group of thinking people in this room and on this, on this campus uh, are located in the development of ecology and food and the, food, uh, and the ecology of food. Uh, my point of reference is always very shallow and I would like to position you, audience, into today. Uh, I don't know how many people got this news from today's New York Times, Washington Post, et cetera, et cetera, uh, about Prodigin, a uh, company Prodigin in uh, College Station, Texas, um, had to recall, had to send out a warning, I don't really know how it worked, that uh, USDA uh, stopped an elevator in, uh, I think, Nebraska, that had been growing soybeans because the soybeans that were being pulled into that elevator were mixed with uh, a recombinant with transgenic corn that, had, that produces a pharmaceutical. They refused to say what it is, but apparently it's dangerous enough that they, they decided to stop the elevators. Uh, there are $2.7 million worth of seed slated as of today to be burnt, and uh, they're slated to be burnt because the less than one acre that was planted to this pharmaceutical producing corn got mixed in with 500 bushels of soybeans and those got mixed in with 500,000 bushels of soybeans ready to go into the, um, into the uh, commodities market. So they had to stop the whole lot, the, the, the half a million uh, 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 bushels. And, and, and that's where I think I would like to start to explore why this happened, what's, ha what's going on up there, that the presence of a very small amount of seeds in uh, the stock of a commodity would be so important that it would make it to the news in the first place and that it would uh, be worth uh, burning $2.7 million. To get there, I, um, I wanted to refer to Michael's surprise at, at learning that uh, I am a microbial ecologist. Uh, because I've known Michael more than anything as a practitioner of environmental science and environmental thinking. Uh, it turns out that, yes, indeed, I am a, I'm a, I'm a microbial ecologist, but I think you know me more because of the recent uh, work in my lab about a year ago, almost exactly to the date. My lab discovered the presence of something similar to what happened today, but at the genetic level. Discovered the presence of transgenic DNA, transgenic material in corn in Oaxaca in Mexico, which is uh, the place where corn was domesticated, first domesticated, and where we hold the diversity of gen the genetic diversity of that uh, second most important crop. And that, of course, uh, was a very large scandalous news that has been rolling in the, in the main media uh, for the best part of the year. Still, uh, this last week, we had um, uh, major coverage of that, and I think it will continue for a few months. And how is it that a microbial ecologist or even a cultural historian comes into this fray and all of a sudden becomes, disappears disciplinarily uh, from, from, the, uh, from, the, from the landscape of his or her discipline? I think uh, it's, it's not surprising. As a microbial ecologist, I was trained or I am trained to look at the ecology of that which we cannot see. And I believe that in that world, in the realm of the unseen, in the realm of the microscopic, we are undergoing a major revolution. This is a revolution that has uh, parallels only, I believe, in the Great Columbian Exchange, what some people uh, refer to as the discovery of the Americas, which from the biological point of view was really the breaking down of very important barriers that existed before this event, this historical event. And uh, that led, as we all know, to a major reconfiguration of the biosphere, not to speak about uh, human society, politics, policy, economy, uh, everything. I believe that we are, go we are, under we are undergoing, we are really uh, uh, beasts of a similar revolution. We are uh, part of a similar revolution that relates to what Michael kind of invited me to, to speak about, which is the transgenization of the environment, the introduction of transgenic organisms into the environment. This so-called biotech revolution, some people call it the blue revolution, 
uh, has as its common theme the breakdown of another very important barrier or set of set, sets of barriers that were not broken culturally in, in, in cultural history as well as in evolutionary history uh, before, and this is the barrier of the species, the barrier of what one can exchange in terms of DNA between uh, uh, compartments of the environment that before were separate, that we would call species. We have acquired the capacity to break down those barriers and get material, genetic material, informatic material to be exchanged across those compartments. Sounds very simple. It sounds irrelevant because it happens in the world in the domain of the unseen. But I do believe that it is uh, going to be, it is actually uh, happening as a similar change as we saw in the Great Columbian Exchange. The removing of these barriers has, will have major uh, consequences that we can only speculate about. And I think Michael has been really good at, uh, at helping us think, speculate, and try to predict what the consequences will be. I think there are major trends in the way we are uh, uh, proposing to do this transformation, this re revolution of the biosphere, uh, ostensibly to produce food. Originally, the idea was to produce more food, to feed the, feed the world, et cetera, et cetera. But as we know from today's news, as well as the development of new products, a lot of it will have to do with all kinds of other things that have nothing to do with food production. The production of chemicals, industrial chemicals, the production of pharmaceuticals, uh, and, and all kinds of other things have been opened. There is this Pandora box, that, the Pandora box that has been opened uh, through the breakdown of these barriers. What are the trends that I see happening out there because of this trans, uh, transformation? Well, the same trends, the same type of events that happened with the Great Columbian Exchange. Number one, most importantly, a trend towards homogenization. Michael talked about uh, uh, monoculture, and that's one very important way in which humans actively homogenized, homogenized but also uh, inadvertently, the Great Columbian Exchange resulted in great homo homogenization of the biosphere. Things that used to be different started becoming more and more similar. With the transformation of the biosphere through transgenic manipulations, I think we're going to be, we're seeing a trend towards homogenization in the domain of genetics, of the genetics of the biosphere. That, of course, is uh, superimposed or underimposed over the globalization trend, the, a trend towards uh, the uh, ex expansion of claims, this could be intellectual, pr intellectual property rights claims, as well as claims over uh, uh, just ownership and, and, uh, and access, as well as the impacts, the uh, globalization of impacts. Whatever I do in my lab here in Berkeley will have an impact all, all over the world, eventually over evolutionary time. The manipulations that I'm doing today I think will have major repercussions around the biosphere. And there, I, I did want to respond to your, to your question uh, that you invited me to say, is the biotech revolution um, changing things only because of the way we're applying it or because there's something intrinsically, uh, intrinsic in it that makes it different? My belief is that there is something intrinsic in the manipulation, uh, the, the transformation using transgenic DNA biology that, that pushes the biosphere towards this homogenization, to, towards uh, the third tra trend, which is the microbialization, if you will, the pulling everybody into this domain of mind, the domain of the microbes. Some people have called the viralization of the biosphere, in which the rules of exchange of, uh, of genetic material, the rules of exchange of, of uh, information, are changed from rules that uh, used to be, in our time, our time of eukaryotes, a time of large organisms used to be uh, ruled by highly choreographed exchanges of, of information. And you can think of uh, 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 mating rituals in large organisms all the way down to the, if you wish, rituals of chromosomal exchange and uh, chromosomal pairing and exchange of genetic material. So there was great choreography going on. Uh, that doesn't happen when you have uh, the viral, viralization of these processes. All of a sudden, you have just almost uh, a random exchange or the capacity to produce almost random exchange, almost random exchange of information and genetic material. The question for me, and I think the interesting question for this conversation tonight, 
and I come back to Michael, is who are we in that revolution? I think it's really important and really interesting for me to situate myself in, as part of that revolution and in the development of that revolution. And I note that uh, most of the, the one technology, I believe, or the one technological package that was really important in the uh, uh, Great Colombian Exchange was, of course, navigation technology. And I note that most of the ships that traveled across the Atlantic usually carried a naturalist on them. So I see myself as a naturalist, which I've always aspired to be. I see Michael also as one of those naturalists, one of those people who, uh, who would like to think. Riding, dr riding on the very technology, on the very te technological transformation that, uh, of that revolution. Just as uh, I think uh, Darwin much later was writing on the very technological uh, uh, vehicle that had created that revolution. I think we are here riding on that technological package of, of transgenic uh, manipulation and change and that we have this great opportunity to be naturalists in, in that, uh, in, in, in that uh, revolution. Um, those ships also had usually a narrator, somebody who would narrate what was happening. A historian, we call them today, but at that time it was someone more like Michael, someone who was just very curious about the behavior of those people who were actually performing that revolution, who were actually riding those ships. And I think I see Michael very much as, as that, but I see all of us thinkers about uh, whatever the discipline or the field that you are in as those narrators, or at least people who have that opportunity to narrate, to leave some kind of history of what happened for the future uh, to hopefully get a handle on, on these transformations, these major transformations, because up to this point, we have been writing this transformation, this revolution, pretty much with closed eyes. Pretty much with very few exceptions, like Michael, people who have the capacity and have the willingness to take on someone like Monsanto and, uh, and, and write about what's happening, not for, not against, but simply narrate what's happening. And we also have the, the opportunity, and I think that's a much more political statement, of try and think and decide who is riding that technology, who is riding that ship, and where that ship is going. Um, just as some of those narrators back in the, during, the, during, the, during colonial times uh, did have some impact on how those technological gizmos, that, those ships, uh, uh, warfare technologies and so on were being moved over the landscape, I think we do have an opportunity today as narrators and thinkers to uh, make, make decisions and help decision makers to drive those gizmos of biotech, those te technological gizmos of biotechnology. Uh, so I would like to invite you to recognize in, 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 in the simple, beautiful writing that Michael does this incredibly important historical uh, task and to recognize in whatever it is that you do and, and, and we do, I as a scientist, you as whatever you are, uh, the opportunity to take control the opportunity to at least recognize, realize that we are doing this, and the great responsibility that we have towards, in this case, not only other humans that look a little bit different from us, which were, for example, the Amerindians back then, but all the other species that are not us, and the future generations of those species and of humans. So with that, I think I'll stop. Thank you. Before um, Patricia speaks, I first want to thank the really, the, the Thank the panelists for the wonderful presentations and the really very different um, presentations um, so far. Before uh, Patricia starts speaking, I just remember something very important that I hadn't said about her, which is that she has her degree um, in English from Stanford University, but then she saw the light and did her graduate <laughs> studies in journalism at Berkeley. It's true. <laughs> Well, um, I have the honor of being last and uh, trying to uh, pull these uh, uh, very uh, huge and interesting ideas together. And uh, I'm afraid I can only do it in the microcosm because I took this opportunity uh, to uh, think about ecology in terms of my restaurant, the Hay Street Grill, and the morality of, of that, of what that means day to day 
on the front lines, discussing, I mean, every day I think about exactly the problems that Michael uh, has, has talked about, which is um, uh, balancing kind of the needs of my business versus the needs of um, keeping the planet alive. And, um, <laughs> and it's very tiny, and I'm trying to do the best I can. So I, I, took, I took this opportunity to, to, to think about it and, and write this, this little piece, which uh, I guess I'm going to read. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just uh, I didn't know which way to go on this thing. But at any rate, um, uh, as, I'm, as a restaurant owner, I'm concerned about the health and sustainability of food sources, as well as being very deeply involved with the issues of food in general. And of course, um, food has three basic functions, as far as I'm concerned. It, on the basic level, it's fuel. Uh, secondly, uh, it's pleasure and possibly entertainment. And of course, most recently, and maybe forever, food's become a statement about moral decision. And um, I'm, it, this role um, of balancing all these has changed considerably over the 20 years I've been running a restaurant in San Francisco. Now, some of this history illustrates the conflicts and dilemmas of a moral nature which face everyone who eats. But people in the business of feeding others have a heightened consciousness about these moral implications. We all know, every one of us knows the choices and the impact of the choices that every individual faces when he buys food um, in the supermarket or uh, at the farmer's market or at an expensive restaurant or at a cheap restaurant. I mean, just think about this process for the moment of, of choosing your food. Now think about a restaurant owner who's making the decisions for the customer, on the customer's behalf, in effect with a moral imperative from the customer. By choosing to eat at my place, the customer is tacitly endorsing the moral decision making of the owner. The owner has to be conscious of the role of both providing moral leadership and providing the kind of moral leadership that the customer will subscribe to in order to stay in business. I first opened my restaurant with an aesthetic idea about freshness. I was lounging on the Dalmatian coast with my current partner eating grilled fish pulled directly from the then the pristine Adriatic and thinking that this kind of cookery would work very well in San Francisco. In fact, the owners of one of the city's oldest and most popular restaurants, the Tadich Grill, came from this coast and were grilling fish much the same way, but freshness was not their top priority. They did whatever it took to put out what was written on their menu every day, whether um, uh, you know they had to use fresh, frozen, or canned ingredients. I wanted to take this concept of the traditional San Francisco grill a step further, or maybe backwards to its roots, and cook with only fresh foods. Right off the bat, I was faced with the dilemma of not having enough food to offer. This was in 1979. In those early days, we just used a blackboard to list, and by the way, I, run, I wanted to do basically a fish restaurant. So way back there, we only used a blackboard to list all of our fish, and sometimes we could only find two or three fresh fish to serve. There was plenty of frozen seafood available, but we couldn't serve it because I didn't think it tasted as good as that grilled fish I'd had in Europe. People would stream in on their way to the Opera House, Davies Hall wasn't built then, uh, and look at the blackboard and shake their heads. Is this all you have tonight, they'd ask? Then, on top of this, I insisted that um, the fish be undercooked by the then current standards. I felt that if the fish were fresh, it didn't need to be cooked to death and, um, and lose its, its texture and flavor when, when you overcook it. Many a plate of salmon was sent back to be refired, and the waiters began telling people to ask for their fish well done just to get them out on time. <laughs> we adjusted to the customers, and the customers adjusted to us. But when I think about, back about that time, I, I really am embarrassed because I was so doctrinaire about the way I thought it should be done. I wanted to teach people how good 
fish could be if it were cooked right. <laughs> Luckily, <laughs> the people kept coming back. There weren't many other places to eat in the neighborhood, and they must have been conv convinced. And on our part, we started finding more fresh fish to prepare. Our fish purveyor, Paul Johnson, a friend who started his business because we started running a fish restaurant, mainly looked for the prettiest fish for us, no matter where it came from or how it was caught. And both of us started realizing, as we doubled our restaurant in size, and he started selling more and more fish to different restaurants, that certain fish had been very much in demand that these fish, like Gulf Red Snapper or Dungeness Crabs or Atlantic Cod, were getting harder and harder to find. But we didn't think too much about it, and uh, we just moved on to the next fish that came onto the market uh, that was fresh and pretty and cooked up nicely. We didn't think about this. Then, in about 1985, we had the parasite scare. Local fish from the bay were ingesting parasites from the waste of all the sea lions that were multiplying uncontrollably in the bay. Fishermen traditionally used to kill them, but now conservationists insist on protecting the seals. And as attractive as these monsters were to the tourists, they were ruining the, the local fish supply. The press reported that you had to cook fish well done to be safe. So I faced another dilemma, health versus aesthetics. I got a parasitologist from UCSF to test the fish for parasites at different temperatures. We figured out exactly how little I could cook the fish <laughs> and still be safe. But we had to convince the waiters, who had to convince the diners, who knew all along that there was a reason why you had to fish, eat fish well done, that we were cooking the fish the right way. Today, I wish that were my worst problem. Now, everyone is, you know, is fearless about eating raw fish. People love crudo and carpaccio and tartare, and it's not a problem. Undercooking is no longer an issue. Um, so I, I won that aesthetic battle, I feel. But every morning these days, I have a surrealistic conversation with my fish man about what I morally can serve in the restaurant. We all agree that local fish are the best choice, but there happens to be a Pacific Coast fishing moratorium that extends from Baja to the Canadian border in order to protect endangered rockfish, which used to be very cheap and plentiful. You know, red snapper, it was on every menu, and are now facing extinction. But what this means is, is that the local sand dab and petrali fisheries have been shut down even though the small boats out of the Half Moon Bay that, that we use uh, in San Francisco uh, have absolutely no bycatch of, the, of these endangered rockfish. I mean, these boats should be allowed to go out, but the federal regulators don't have the manpower to certify that they're catching cleanly. So da and dabs and petrali are the mainstay of our San Francisco grill, and um, so many other fish have dropped off our OK list that I, I, I sort of fear that the whole thing is going to come full circle. I'm going to have a blackboard with two fish on it. It's really, really an issue. Here, I'm going to give you an example. For example, we can't serve now the delicious satiny Chilean sea bass because they're facing extin extinction from pirating near Antarctica. Besides which, I happen to be a personal spokesperson for their boycott. Okay, and I will not serve farm salmon because I've been convinced that high intensity fish farming pollutes the ocean. So of course I had to take all the smoked salmon off the menu because all the smokers, large or small, use only farm salmon for size conformity, cleanliness, there are no parasites because they feed them antibiotics and texture. Now this, sam this farm salmon, salmon issue encapsulates the crux of the moral dilemma that a little guy like me faces. 80% of the customers who walk into the fish restaurant want to eat salmon. And I've taken it off the menu uh, when I can't get it wild. Now what does this mean? What if customers stop coming because they can't get salmon? 68 people that I employ depend on my restaurant for their livelihood. Should I put their you know, well-being at risk? Maybe I should put farm salmon on the menu label it as such, and let the customer make the decision. That's advocated by my husband. But, my <laughs> <laughs> but, by, but by buying the farm product, I feel I can't do this because when I buy the farm product, I'm endorsing it. And if I and every other restaurant stops buying it, there's a chance that the farming practices might become more sustainable. I started the restaurant making choices for people because 
that's, I just wanted to tell people what was good and, <laughs> and what's bad, and, and I, I can't stop now. So my fishman and I debate <laughs> the morality of every item on the menu, the trade-offs, the compromises, the lesser of evils. Um, scallops, for example, are very plentiful. The fisheries off Maine and Rhode Island is strong, but the technique of collecting the scallops off the bottom of the ocean destroys habitat. We're all hoping for a solution. I still sell them. And just recently, here's the latest, a doctor in Marin reported that 89 of 116 of her quote unquote affluent patients who reported symptoms of fatigue, aching joints, and memory loss had elevated mercury levels in their blood and happened to eat fish more than two times a week. Uh, so there was a mercury scare. Paul Johnson and I, uh, my fish man, batted that around. We consulted an FDA list to discover that the only fish that we actually dealt with um, uh, and that had a mercury standard, uh, you know, above the USDA level was swordfish. And actually, I'm not sure that the uh, smaller Pacific swordfish that, that we're getting from Southern California actually has a higher level of mercury, but they are smaller fish, which is a warning flag that they might be overfished. And as a conscientious restaurateur and public spokesperson for ocean conservation and sustainable fishing, which I am, I sometimes feel like I'm in a squirrel cage. How do I reconcile putting the tastiest food in the table, which is why I started the restaurant, with treading lightly on the planet? So I started the restaurant as a cultural aesthetic statement about food, and I'm fighting on as a moral arbiter about what's okay to eat and what's not, and trying to find some balance between food as fuel and pleasure and morality. Our waiters used to say, bon appetit as they set their plates down on the table, which I think relates to the idea of food as fuel, as satisfaction of hunger. Then they went through a stage of saying enjoy. I told them not to say this, but they said it. <laughs> and, uh, and this, of course, is a measure about pleasure, a message about pleasure. And now, waiters all over America say good choice. <laughs> Now what, what, what they probably mean, what they probably are meaning to do is compliment the customer on how sophisticated uh, his or her choices, you know, that they've tasted the tastiest things on the menu. But the current usage also reflects how important choice has become as a moral imperative in public consumption. Moral choice has become intrinsic to the dinner table. Michael has been writing about. In fact, the restaurant these days is a representation of the culture of morality, a culture that's become so prominent here in Berkeley and the Bay Area. Uh, you know, it's almost a, 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 I don't know, it's a, <sighs> It's a battle, almost. Um, uh, morality infuses the very language of the menu. A menu uh, may proudly list, for example, Marakita Farm heirloom tomatoes, and actually mine does. But no menu can explain what this description, what this language means. So here's the backstory. I buy these tomatoes directly from the farmer at the Ferry Plaza Farmer's Market, and I happen to know that these tomatoes are raised organically, but they do not qualify for the new federal organic label because the farmer has decided he's beyond organic and he, and he purposely wants to raise the question of what is more important, organic or local, small farm versus big. And after a lot of soul searching, I've decided I personally support local uh, and small over certified organic <coughs> and large. But as we know, that's a whole other story. Only those deep into buying locally can read a menu and know um, what the restaurant, what, um, uh, where a restaurant stands on this issue. Or, I'm going to give you one last example and then wrap it up. Or a menu may list turtle-free North Carolina shrimp. This means that the shrimp are wild, but caught with special nets that allow endangered sea turtles to escape. I happen to believe that wild shrimp caught sustainably is pre preferable to most kinds of shrimp from farms which are notorious for destroying coastal wetlands and precious spawning grounds. This menu description of two fragments of dishes, tomatoes and shrimp, are indicative of a layered moral narrative that's caused well-meaning restaurateurs like me a lot of lost sleep. 
<laughs> we, we only thought we were in the business of giving people pleasure. We didn't know we'd end up being moral ar arbiters and that the restaurant would become a battleground, an educational tool, a political pa platform about the morality of eating. <laughs> Many thanks for a fourth wonderful presentation. If we could collect the questions, uh, perhaps in the um, time it takes to do that, um, Michael might have an initial response to some of the things that people have said. And if he doesn't, we will get some questions from the floor. Uh, no, only that I'm very provoked by everything I heard. Um, uh, Patricia's, you know, uh, she should publish that piece. It's a wonderful piece. Uh, I'm just trying to think of who should publish that piece for. Um, <laughs> uh, and I think it points to something very interesting, which is that the chef, I mean, you think about the chef as a social role um, in, in our society. I mean, has there ever been a time, maybe you can answer this, I don't know, where, where chefs have become educators, moral arbiters, and actually actual forces for change. What is going on in the fisheries around this country, and I know certainly in the East Coast, has been driven by chefs organizing to save the swordfish or save the cod or anything like that. And that is, that's an, an astonishing um, development, I think, and, and, and very hopeful one. Um, I think this metaphor, Ignacio's mem metaphor of the Colombian exchange is a very powerful one, and, and I'd never thought about what's going on with genetic engineering in that way, and uh, it's one I want to play with. And um, also, you know, whenever you see what you think of, as, as a journalist, you know, you think your concerns are incredibly contemporary, and uh, it's always very uh, chastening to learn that they're incredibly old, but we have to pretend otherwise to go on writing journalism. So I, I just found, you know, so much to think about. I mean, I was busy writing notes, so much to think about in all these presentations. I'm very grateful for them. Um, do we have any questions? Given this tendency toward homogeneity and industrial processing, what do you think of a food system, uh, that a food system would look like if it were sustainable in some esoteric or hypothetical sense? And here comes the question, can we conceive of, or better yet create, a deindustrialized food system? And if so, would anyone want it? Uh, you know, I've, I've often thought about that question, and I was talking to this, this farmer, I was interviewing this farmer named Rick Noel, who's a biodynamic farmer up here in Brentwood. And I said, well, Rick, uh, you know, it's a, he, he has big production. I mean, he says that he produced, he gets something like $40,000 worth of produce off, off of each of his acres a season. And I said, well, can you, add, and he's a real advocate for this biodynamic farming. And I said, well, you can't feed the world this way. He said that if everyone practiced his method of biodynamic farming, in, if you took the, the Los Angeles basin and turned it over to agriculture and biodynamic, his method of biodynamic farming was practiced there, he could feed the whole country. He said it was absolutely possible. That's all I wanted to <laughs> um, You know, this is a, it's, a, it's a real hard issue whether sustainable agriculture can feed the world, and I don't know the answer. Um, I do know a couple things. Industrial agriculture is not now feeding the world. Um, there is enormous issues of, of equity and distribution. Um, there's plenty of food that's grown. There's, there, there's enough being grown to feed the world, but uh, it's concentrated. It's in the hands of the people who have the money. And um, uh, so it is not, um, in a way, it's not the issue uh, in one sense, that there is, there is enough food. Uh, it's, it's who commands it. But the other thing is this idea that we should be moving toward a single food chain um, and that we need the one model that's going to do it. That is industrial thinking right there. I mean, that there's only one solution, that we either have this kind of agriculture, either going to be organic or IPM, integrated pest management, or industrial. I think here, too, we have to look at the logic of natural systems, which is you don't put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, we need a lot of different food chains. We need a sustainable food chain. We need an organic food chain. We need a beyond organic food chain. Uh, we need them all for many reasons. One is to test different solutions. We, you know, you, you, you need to experiment and find out what works. Um, and also, you know, some are going to cost more than others. And there, there's enormous issues of, of equity and elitism and sustainable agriculture as now 
practiced um, for all sorts of complicated reasons is produces more expensive food. One reason is that it's not subsidized. Uh, it's a huge reason. I mean, the industrial food system is, we, as we know, is subsidized, you know, to an incredible extent, and um, and organic not at all. So um, uh, I think that this is a question that's always posed by the by in the in by the conventional food system. Can alternatives feed the world? And um, uh, and I think it's very much a question embedded in, uh, in that mindset and that the mindset is part of the problem. Nothing to add. I, I, I totally agree with what Michael said, uh, that the trend towards regionalization and specificity for place is, is really important. I just wanted to add that subsidization, when you talk about subsidization, I think it's important to remember that there, are, there, there is the monetary way of subsidizing things there's also the ecological way of subsidizing things, which is often just taken totally off the books. You know, we're, we're mining water, we're mining soils, we are uh, mining uh, the ocean's ability to deal with the byproducts of, uh, of industrial agriculture and so on. And these are things that, over long enough periods of time, are coming back to haunt us. So I think, just to add to that we should include in the books accounting the, the, uh, the huge subsidies that are ecological subsidies for this uh, way of agricultural practices. I have nothing to say on this topic at all. This is the piece of the answers I came here to listen to. <laughs> Here's a short question, but not easy. Um, and it is, do you see any positive direction for bioengineering? <laughs> Why do you look at me? Uh, actually said, Ignacio. <laughs> <laughs> do I see anything positive about bioengineering? I think bioengineering is an incredible, an incredibly powerful and potentially very useful uh, uh, set of methods and technologies and so on and so forth. Um, I, I, on that, I, I, I think I do agree with you, Michael, on the, uh, the specific history of deployment of specifically transgenic organisms in the environment, makes me feel that whatever we do, we do with transgenic organisms let loose in the environment right now, because of its history, because of the specificity of that history of how it happened, no, I do not see anything really good coming out of it, and, and not, not, not in the next couple of decades. But there are lots of things that can be done in the lab. There are lots of things that can be more or less contained, and I really, really hesitate to kind of endorse it, but but I think there, the, I would never advocate the, uh, the, the moral, moral position of saying, well, let's not look there, because uh, I think there are great things to be done and to be at least learned. For research, for example, uh, genetic engineering is an incredible tool, you know, an eye-opening tool. Uh, the way we have deployed it in this industrial agriculture mindset, in this end of, you know, turn of the 20th century, 21st century uh, time where we're driven by a, 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 an industrial complex that is a, a descendant of the great huge corporations with massive global reach, with strong muscles in government and so on, and the venture capital companies that are used to run on promises that they know that can, they cannot fulfill, but they, uh, they just float them because they, nobody understands what they're talking about. They were used, you know, used to run on red money all the time, and who cares, you know, we'll just cash in our stock and, and move on. This, this whole historical development of how we got into it is, I think, incredibly, um, has incredible potential for damage. You know, the promise of biotechnology is, is, a, is, a, is a very um, seductive thing, and we hear about some wonderful things that can be done with this. We've heard about golden rice, which is rice that has more beta carotene in it, which can help people with uh, uh, nutritional deficiencies, um, uh, plants that can uh, grow in salt conditions, plants that, can, uh, that need less water. But, and they're asking us to judge the technology. The industry asks us to judge the technology on the come, on these promises. But really, what this technology about is about so far, even though it's sold as more sustainable and a way to get us past chemicals, has been about a way to sell a lot more herbicide. 
I mean, most of, you know, with all these grand promises, you know, we've been into this now for six, seven years, and most of the transgenic crops are Roundup Ready crops, I mean, which allow you to, you know, just shower your field with herbicide produced by the same company, Monsanto, that produces the, uh, the plant. Um, so that's what we're really doing with it. Could we be doing other things with it, and might they be good? Yeah. Um, I, I think so, although the more you look at some of these great promises, they retreat on the horizon. It turns out to be a lot harder to do things like, for instance, uh, it sounds, it, it's always struck me as a wonderful idea if you could get plants to fix their own nitrogen in the way that, that legumes do. Uh, they don't need fertil as much nitrogen fertilizer because they can actually take it from the air. It's this wonderful trick that plants have mastered. Well, we're nowhere near mastering that trick ourselves. And uh, apparently th that promise, which was held up as, as one of the things this technology was going to do, is so far away they don't even talk about it anymore. So these, all the interesting things involve many, many genes and, and very complex uh, cassettes of genes that you'd have to move, and, and they're just not near doing it. So be, be wary when you're asked to, to, to um, accept this technology now in order to make a possibility that may or may not be real in the future. I said at the very beginning that I wasn't going to run through all of Michael's honors, but there was one that I really did want to mention. And it happens to be the Borders Original Voice Award for the best book of nonfiction. But I like the original part of it. And it seems to me that his originality has triggered some extremely original panel presentations and original questions as well. So I thank you for coming, and I thank again Joan and Peter Avenali for letting us all be here today. Thanks. <laughs>